a uh, nuclear power like North Korea that has shown um, a level of uh, irresponsibility and um, We had a great conversation with Professor uh, John Robson of the University of Ottawa, a noted historian, documentary filmmaker, and author. He's written three great books, uh, on one on the Magna Carta, one on guns, a right to arms, and The Great War Remembered uh, about World War I. I suggest you check him out. I have the pleasure today to speak to Professor John Robson. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us, John. Happy to be with you. You know, uh, the big news these days is this summit that just occurred in Singapore between U.S. President Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. And, uh, you know, thinking about Korea, uh, Canada has a, uh, like, blood tie to Korea, as Koreans put it, because we participated on, their, on the South Korean side during the Korean War. But in a, in a sense, it's considered like a forgotten war. I think that's what uh, they call it in the U.S. Everybody knows about uh, World War One, Two, certainly Vietnam, but you don't hear Korea very well discussed. And when I talk to Canadians, a lot of them literally didn't even know that we were part of that conflict. Yeah, I, I once forgot it in a speech and got what for from a veteran. So I've only made that mistake once, but. It, yeah, it's, it's, it is sort of feels like the poor cousin of these wars that we won spectacularly because this one, essential as it was, ended in a draw. Yeah, I think that's what it is, is there was no clear winner and, and it, the kind of uh, status quo of, uh, you know, uh, arm, armistice has kind of lasted into the modern era. It's, nothing much has happened there. So you kind of don't want to think about it, right? It's not a clear win. It's not a clear loss. So you people are kind of ambivalent, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, this this division of Korea, it's almost the last piece of debris left from the Cold War, the divided Germany's got. I mean, Putin is trying to bring the Soviet Union back, but I think he's going to fail. But there, there sits North Korea, the one thing that's somehow hung in there and not one of the happier things that came out of the Cold War by any stretch. Definitely true. I mean, uh, conditions in North Korea, uh, some people think it's just uh, propaganda, pro-American propaganda. But I lived in South Korea for many years. I knew a lot of government officials. I talked to defectors from North Korea. I mean, just you, it, it boggles the imagination how bad conditions are for the average person up in the north. So the status quo certainly served in a geopolitical sense, and it didn't lead to like the peninsula getting vaporized in a nuclear cloud. But there's certainly been a lot of suffering uh, by average people, by this sort of Cold War remnant, as you say. So I, it's great to yeah. see that hopefully something is, is going to progress there. And it's so odd that people would take this view that, well, we, we can't admit how bad things are in the North because then it might excuse the failings of the United States. I mean, open societies are very frank about their own shortcomings. You, you can't silence criticism and debate. But you've got to keep your sense of perspective. You've got to realize that, that we are defending a system that can acknowledge and correct its mistakes against people who are aggressive and often insanely aggressive and repressive. I mean, here comes Hitler again, the inevitable analogy. But also the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and the Kim Dynasty in North Korea, who really have inflicted some of the weirdest and most terrible cruelty on their populace that humanity has ever seen. And it should be possible to acknowledge that without having to turn around and say, well, okay, then, you know, I love Ronald Reagan or I love Donald Trump. You can, you can keep a sense of perspective or I'd hope you can. Yeah, I agree. And it, it not only is that a problem that you identify, but also there's this perception that it's, they're a kind of joke that they're buffoons, they're silly goofs. And uh, we should kind of giggle at how silly they are and not realizing like these people are slaves, like they're acting goofy because if you don't act goofy, you get a bullet in the head or you get sent to the salt mine. Yeah, I mean, they, they had episodes of starvation so bad, apparently there was cannibalism going on. Uh, but, but I think this was worse than the, in the 1990s. But you give me an opportunity to quote G.K. Chesterton, which is one of my favorite activities. Please he do. once said, you know, <laughs> People think that the opposite of funny is serious, and it's not. The opposite of funny is not funny and nothing else. And it's possible for something to be ghastly and yet 
comically ghastly. I mean, Mussolini's a case in point. Mussolini is genuinely funny, but at the same time, tragic. In some ways, Hitler was funny. I mean, he was so over the top that if you'd made him up, the publisher would have sent it back. And the the epiphenomena around something as sinister as North Korean dynasty often does have this sickly comic aspect. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that you laugh at it doesn't mean you're not taking it seriously. It just means that you have a full range of reactions. Again, to bring up Charlie Chaplin, the great dictator, he made fun of Hitler because he was very worried about Hitler, not because he wasn't. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, it, like, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, ridicule as a political tool, really. Like, uh, especially people who take themselves so seriously. Nothing gets under the skin more than, you know, making them look ridiculous. I used to live in South Korea for many years, and I once had a North Korean propaganda balloon. They used to float propaganda balloons across the border with leaflets attached, and one of them burst over my house, and my house got showered with these propaganda leaflets. Uh, maybe sometime I'll show I still have a couple of them. I'll, I'll show you. They're ridiculous. Like, who would ever think, picking this up in South Korea, reading that, and going, oh, yeah, that's the way to go. Like, you've convinced me. It would be exactly like, like the opposite. Video. Yeah. But Radio Moscow was hilarious. And in fact, it, it's worth noting that tyranny often produces the best political humor, including one of the Soviet jokes is, how can you make sure that your refrigerator is always full of baloney? Plug it into Radio Moscow. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say uh, Radio Moscow. When I lived in Taiwan, we used to listen to Radio Pyongyang on Friday nights, uh, you know, have a few beers and listen to Radio Pyongyang on shortwave and just laugh our heads off and how ridiculous they were. But again, I did feel a bit of remorse knowing how bad the situation is. But, you know, sometimes you got to laugh or you're going to cry, right? Well, exactly. Life too often gives you no choice. So when you do have a choice, you know, but, but as I said, you can laugh at it without therefore not taking it seriously because the opposite of funny isn't serious. It's just not funny. Uh, there's lots that was funny about Stalin, too. Um, and that doesn't take away from the fact that he was at least as deadly and ideologically driven dictator as Hitler was. Uh, in a way, it's funny that to this day, Marxists get a pass. If someone's a college Marxist, oh, that's so cute. If it turns out you were a Nazi in college, you're done. Uh, but but why? If you look at the body count, you look at Stalin and Mao, you look at the Khmer Rouge, and you look at North Korea, and you realize there is absolutely no excuse for being a Marxist. But that doesn't mean that Marxist rhetoric isn't sometimes comic. Yeah, it's kind of funny that you bring that up, too, because I was uh, chatting with a young uh, person the other day. And they told me, I was just, you know, they were talking about how we, socialism is great and communism is great. And that we've just never implemented real communism. And that's why uh, it's not salient to reference the Soviet Union, communist China, Cuba, blah, 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 because it's not real communism. So I pointed uh, out that he just gave me the no true Scotsman logical fallacy. And he looked at me like a dog I'd just thrown a card trick to, like, oh, like, uh, there's not a lot of thinking going on. It's more like um, this, you know, superficial utopian idea, like, wouldn't it be great? But they just don't really have any historical perspective. And, and that's exactly what I'm trying to get here. Uh, seeing as uh, the Korean War in general, and certainly Canadian participation in the Korean Wars is little known and little considered, that I want to add uh, some context. So, first of all, I know you're an expert, uh, military expert, and uh, you've done a lot of work on that. Your documentary series is excellent. I just wanted to get your take on, first of all, why are Canadians such good soldiers? We certainly are renowned for punching above our weight in uh, World War One, World War Two. The Dutch, you know, we freed uh, the Netherlands in World War Two. We get a lot of love, and Canadians have certainly... Uh, made their mark militarily, you know, fighting against the Axis powers and so on. What is it inherent in Canadians that, you know, makes them such good soldiers? Well, I think it was best summed up actually by an American president, John Quincy Adams, in one of his messages to Congress. He reminded legislators that liberty is power, that you see the free societies of the West going all the way back to the confrontations at Salamis and Plataea and so on between the Persians and the Greeks in the 5th century BC, free people fight differently 
than unfree people. And it's not just a matter of them being more willing to fight, fighting for things that they love. There was an element of that as the Battle of Salamis, when the massively larger Persian fleet was being drawn into a trap the Greeks had worked out. Greek fishermen were rowing out and saying, do you need another hand on the oars? Nobody was volunteering for the Persian fleet. But what is really crucial is that in free societies, there's a kind of dynamism that doesn't turn into chaos. And that finds its way into the military. The Greeks were bickering and arguing all the way to Salamis about how to fight. The Persians weren't talking back to Xerxes because he was a demigod. But the Greeks, in their arguing and bickering, figured it out. And when you look at Canadian soldiers... You see that when they're confronted with a problem, the junior officers, the non-commissioned officers have meaningful input there, listened to respectfully. Even the private soldiers can make suggestions. For instance, at Ortona, when in 1943, they found themselves engaged in house-to-house fighting. And interestingly enough, British battle doctrine did have ways of dealing with that house-to-house problem when you can't go through the streets because there's too much rubble and too many snipers. But they never bothered to pass it on because they thought after World War I, we will never again fight in urban areas. And so what the Canadians figured out how to do, this sort of mouse holing, you take one house, then you go to the top floor, blow a hole in the wall, chuck grenades through, and then fight your way down to the bottom floor of the next house, and then do it all again. So you've always got the advantage of being above your opponents. And so people on the spot could work this out. Um, If they got an order that didn't make sense, the captain could say to the major, tell the colonel, he doesn't understand the situation, it won't happen. And so there's this flexible intelligence in unfree armies. The Soviets were infamous for the poor quality of their NCOs. If orders are not carried out literally, the army doesn't fight at all. And therefore, even bad orders get carried out. Uh, I remember there was a scene at the end of World War II. Marshal Zhukov was explaining to an American the Soviet approach to minefields. He said, if we encounter a minefield, we attack as though it was not there. Because we assume we will take no more casualties that way than if we allowed the enemy to funnel us into areas where they'd set up their artillery and machine guns as killing zones. And there's a certain you know, bloody logic to that. But there's also the fact that the Soviet army couldn't trust their army to improvise. And so Canadians have always been that way. They're able to take initiative, to take responsibility, to adapt creatively to the battlefield and not just melt away or become paralyzed if rigid discipline is not maintained. It also helps that Canadians were familiar with weapons, but the main thing is that free people can take responsible initiative. Okay, I I agree in general terms, but uh, thinking about the beginning of World War One and uh, you know the meat grinder in the trenches in World War One, where you had these uh, you know effete, inbred uh, British officers commanding Canadian troops, it certainly wasn't true then, was it? I mean, you had these guys who, it's like a Monty Python sketch, you know, oh, Bungo, back from the wolf, you know, meanwhile, they'd send them over the top to get mowed down and shoot in a hamburger. Well, no, I think I think you're being unfair there. I will tell you, when the Canadians first arrived in Britain, some British officers' verdict was they'll make fine soldiers once all their officers are shot. But... The thing about you have to understand about World War One is that it was fought under very difficult circumstances. In the early part of the war, the Germans took all the good ground. They were at the gates of Paris within months, and the next three and a half years were spent pushing them back. So, of course, they were always on the raised hillsides, looking down with open fields of fire, with carefully prepared positions um, and and defensive resources and supplies and so on in the back of the hills. How are you meant to overcome those positions given the technology of 1914 to 1916? And as the Allied commanders experiment with their offensives, they do work out tactics. And Arthur Curry plays a major role. So Canadian Arthur Curry was an excellent commander. Lord Bing also uh, was an able leader. But we did have a lot of bad uh, British staff officers uh, who threw away a lot of Canadian lives. Would you agree? Well, not very much. I would rather have had their officers than the French. The French, for instance, at the beginning (laughs) of the war discouraged the digging of trenches because they thought it blunted offensive spirit. Um, they, they resisted taking off the red pants that were making their soldiers easy marks. But what eventually developed with Curry in particular is the leapfrogging, that instead of trying to push right through the German lines, you set modest objectives for the first wave. They then take them and dig in for a counterattack. Then you jump over them with fresh troops. But at, whenever you run out of momentum and the Germans counterattack, You've got prepared positions, and there's a very heavy toll. And to bring up the Battle of the Somme, because this is the classic blackadder, the plans to continue the slaughter until everyone's dead except General Haig, Mrs. Haig, and their pet tortoise, Allen. <laughs> the British and the Canadians took terrible casualties on the Somme, but the Germans took more. 
the later a, a German staff officer called the Somme the, the muddy grave of the German field army. It broke the Germans because the British successfully forced the Germans into counterattacks that cost them men they could not afford. One of the reasons they went for unrestricted submarine warfare in the early spring of 1917 was, as, as General Ludendorff, I think, said, we must save the men from a second Somme. And that submarine warfare brought the Americans in and sealed the Germans' doom. And before you criticize them too heavily, the question you have to ask is this, what would you have done? The Germans have occupied almost all of Belgium, and they're committing atrocities. They've occupied a fair bit of northeastern France. Do you say it's too much trouble, you can have it? Or do you fight until you push them back? If you're going to push them back, how do you do it? How do you get the Germans, who are also excellent soldiers, out of these fortified trench systems with interlocking fields of fire and barbed wire and artillery? It's not something, it's not as though they had some easy alternative they just overlooked and instead they killed a bunch of men. But it's important to remember about World War I, we did win it. We did actually break the German army even after they defeated the Russians and transferred all these men to the West and launched this last big offensive in the spring of 1918. The Allies, and particularly the British, the French were not winning that war without us. I won't belittle the sacrifices at Verdun, but the French, um, their army actually mutinied in the spring of 1917. They had taken so many casualties for so little that they refused to fight. It's a little known story, but the, but the French generals eventually realized what had happened, and they thought if we tell the politicians, they'll blab it, we'll lose the war. So they went to the British generals and said, you know, you'll never guess what's happened. Our army is refusing to fight and we can't tell our politicians. And the British generals thought we better not tell ours either, because, again, somebody will yap it and the Germans will realize the way to Paris is open. That's one of the reasons for Passchendaele is it was vitally necessary to draw the Germans away from the French sector. And so this was done at terrible cost, but it wasn't because they were stupid. It's because they were in a very tight corner. And again, it wore down the German army to the point that, you know, Operation Michael in the spring of 1918 did break the Allied lines, but then it ran out of steam. And then the Allies regrouped and counterattacked. And again, bear in mind, the Canadians, a quarter of all Canadian casualties in the Great War are in the last hundred days. In mobile warfare, when they are driving the Germans back out of all these ill-gotten gains. And it's a tremendous victory. But given the technology of the late 19th and early 20th century, and given the German proficiency in using it, there is no possible way of winning that war that doesn't involve the death of millions of men. So you either lose the war, and then, you know, the Germans are going to be back for more. It's not like they would have stopped. Or you prepare for this terrible grind under unfavorable circumstances. It would have been better to prevent the war if the Americans had made it clear they would fight, or if you understood what was coming and not let the Germans get the jump on you. But given that that happened, I don't look at the Allied war plans and say, well, you know, if I'd been there, well, I'd have told them to do this and that, and my golly, we'd have been in Berlin in 1915 with 100,000 dead. There's just no way to do that. You make uh, very good points. And we kind of strayed a little bit because we're trying to get to talking about the Korean conflict, but it's uh, an excellent answer to the question or basically the throwaway insult I made about British staff officers. So I take your point. But uh, something that was a little different with the Korean conflict, first of all, like how did Canadians become involved and entangled in the conflict? Um, was that just... Uh, uh, you know, something that came down for, I, I don't even believe we ran our own foreign policy when that conflict started, did we? So how is it that we ended up committing forces to the Korean conflict? Well, it's because we'd finally learned the lesson of the 1930s, that aggression needed to be resisted or it would start small and get big. And it's amazing. I mean, in the run up to the war, two things to note. One is that the, the Americans were unhappy with their South Korean ally for being insufficiently democratic. And so they actually said, South Korea is not a vital interest of the United States. It's not part of our defense perimeter. We don't have troops there. And the North Koreans said, ah, weakness, let's attack. And Stalin thought the same thing. And eventually Mao thought it in spades. And so the North Koreans invade. And, and then everybody goes, oh, no, uh, here we go again. We have once again failed to defend Czechoslovakia. We've got to get going. And then I remember there was a line in David Berkson's book, Blood on the Hills, that he says, when the Secretary General of the UN says, please, everybody help. South Korea is under attack. It was a, an invitation to a come-as-you-are party, and Canada was naked. 
Because we had actually managed pretty much to disarm. At the end of World War II, we had the third largest navy and the fourth largest army in the world, which is amazing considering that we had a population of 11 million people. Right, and we, so we demobilized. And something that is uh, kind of singular about our troop commitment to the Korean conflict, whereas in World War I, World War II, we had a mix of volunteers and conscripts, that the soldiers in the Korean conflict were purely volunteers. Yeah, now luckily we did have, of course, a lot of World War II veterans who were only five years away from that conflict would have still been... But they did volunteer, like they didn't... uh, I mean, as a regular army or as a veteran, you could choose to volunteer, but they didn't, uh, you know, mandate, uh, you know, professional army guys to go. Like it was still considered a volunteer... Awesome, yeah, oh yeah. Wasn't they, they didn't have conscription, but the point is just there were a lot of people who didn't need a lot of training, just right, a refresher right. course. Mm-hmm. And we did have a lot of gear li- lying around. I mean, I'm always embarrassed when you look at Canada's military today, and you look at the kind of commitment, what we were able to send to Korea, including, I think, eight destroyers. I believe we sent an aircraft carrier. I mean, we were actually a military power to be reckoned with. And we got involved in Korea because we just understood there are aggressions that need to be met. And... Uh, uh, the other thing that's an interesting parallel with World War One, when you look at the outcome in Korea, the fact that it ended in a stalemate, and you say, oh, well, we should have gone on to victory. But again, how would you do that? I mean, the Americans initially managed the, the landings in Incheon behind the North Korean lines, turned the tide, drove into North Korea, which I thought was a very reasonable thing to do. But there were warnings. China will come in if you... Uh, go past a certain point in the American Well, MacArthur was actually was advocating in public to nuke Beijing, wasn't he? Yeah, which is perhaps a little much. Um, but then they do get the Chinese. And of course, the Chinese send in enormous numbers of ill-trained, ill-prepared troops. They, you know, their attitude is just more where they came from. You know, the, the casualties are on an enormous scale and they just don't care. They, to them, life is cheap, their own as well as other people's. And uh, then you, you get the, the line stabilized again and you are faced with a situation where pushing for victory might lead to nuclear war, but your enemies don't care. The Chinese would have taken South Korea if they could. Um, The Soviets would have done a bit of a, you know, broom handle approach, but they would have been willing to, whereas we had to be more reasonable. But then Eisenhower, when he was, uh, became president, did hint that nuclear weapons might be used. And suddenly you got an armistice after, uh, and, and a real settlement after a whole lot of absolutely futile talks. So, you know, there was a big stick going there. But I think it is commendable, given that there wasn't this path to victory, easy or hard, that the Western nations, including Canada, did what needed to be done to stop it, to set an example, we will fight. And um, just as a side note, I was talking about, you know, going back to the Salamis and the Persians. In Carnage and Culture, Victor Davis Hanson mentions that for 2,500 years, the ratio of casualties Western and non-Western armies is about 1 to 10. It's extraordinary how much better Western armies fight. And that is certainly true. The Chinese had casualties on an enormous scale. And they probably could It's a morale probably- thing, right? Essentially? Sorry? It's a, it's a question of morale. And like well, a free person... This flexible ability to improvise, to figure out how things work, to come up with battle tactics other than just the human wave, to recognize when something's not working and do something else... Um, and so the Chinese are willing to lose all these lives. And in the end we save, and you, you lived in South Korea. Well, look at the difference between South and North Korea. Yeah. It's very good for the people of Korea. Very good indication to people around the world that the Western Alliance will fight, that communist invasions won't work. And of course, the Soviets started to get very leery of their Chinese ally, partly because of the Korean war. Eventually they wouldn't give Mao nuclear weapons because they thought he wanted to start a nuclear war. This is one of the reasons they thought he was a very, very reckless partner to have. Well, they fought and several they, skirmishes, didn't they? The Soviet union and the communist Chinese. Oh yeah. Along they, they, the actually, border. they got into it in the sixties. And in fact, mm. there's a story, I, I can't remember if it's Nixon or Kissinger tells the story that, um, they had assumed that, it was these maniacal Chinese causing this. You know, they're just such complete idiots. But then they pulled out maps and looked, and they saw that a lot of the fighting was around Soviet railheads. So they realized the Soviets were picking the place where they could supply them. It's one of the reasons for the opening to China, uh, that they realized that the Chinese were frightened of the Soviets. But frightened or not, the Chinese were reckless in a way that was scary even in Moscow. Uh, but, yeah, again, you and you then – this leads, of course, to the Vietnam War, and the Americans eventually lose the Vietnam War, but they buy a whole lot of time for their allies to develop. I mean, South Korea is such an industrially advanced place by now. It's amazing where the you know, high-tech centers of the world and North Korea 
they're eating grass. Yeah, well, can I tell you a story, John? Uh, when I was there, I mean, the Koreans, uh, the older generation, they have a lot of respect for Canadians because, again, they feel like we've spilled blood for them. If you go to the Korean War Memorial, all of our war dead are memorialized there, and they have a lot of respect. And so every year when they have celebrations, they invite the old boys, the veterans, uh, back. Uh, sadly, there's fewer and fewer of them every year. But I used to meet them. Uh, I used to live near the main military base, a uh, foreigner ghetto, so to speak, and I'd see the old boys walking down the street just boggling, because you know. and I'd go and uh, talk to them, I'm a Canadian, oh, let's go have a coffee, this and that, and they'd tell me these crazy stories, like the last time they were there, it was a smoking crater, and you know, it was all like people dying of malnutrition dressed in rags, and you go there now, and it's like Buck Rogers in the 25th century, and they'd get all choked up, like because they could see that the sacrifices that they made have, you know, and there were a lot of uh, atrocity and excesses committed by the authoritarian governments in South Korea. But it did eventually lead to a very free pluralist society, which I feel very honored to have seen that transition take place uh, from the early 90s to today. And, uh, you know, which is, again, another reason why I'm down on Canada, because I've seen people, like, pull themselves together as a society and, and just achieve incredible success and it just seems like we feel like we're better than them or more developed. And yet, you know, uh, we have potholes the size of swimming pools in the capital city. Or as I like to call it, the capital city of uh, our country, <laughs> our hometown. Yeah. yeah, and again, if you look at the advantages that we have had, and they come from, you know, natural resources to be sure, but also the blessings of liberty. The fact that we have come out of the British tradition with Magna Carta, rights of the individual. We have been so fortunate, and we live in a part of the world where invasions are highly improbable. And... We really, I think, ought to take a lesson from people like South Korea and indeed from Israel about how it is possible to build a successful and increasingly in South Korea pluralistic, certainly in Israel pluralistic society, even in the shadow of annihilation, whereas we have so many advantages that we tend to be somewhat frivolous in our approach to all kinds of things. The idea that Canada might bankrupt itself, that Ontario would be the most indebted subnational government in the world, what on earth? I mean, of course, they can borrow more because their situation is so privileged. But when you look at the difficulties that so many places have, how could we have thought we needed to do this to ourselves? I, I do think that there is a bit of the spoiled rich kid in the way that Canadians often treat their advantages as though they earned them when they inherited them and as though nothing we can do could squander them. There's a lot of ruin in a nation, but why test that? I hear you. And uh, just getting back to what you were saying about um, sticking up for these people, defending their freedom, like trying to spread the idea of liberty, would you call our intervention, uh, when I say our, like the Western intervention on behalf of the South Koreans, a proto-example of an R2P? Well, it, it, to some extent, yes. But, uh, you know, much as I would like to save everybody from trouble, we aren't king of the world. We have not been crowned. We have not been given that responsibility. We have to protect ourselves. And we understand that if you let your allies get picked off one by one, you will end up fighting alone in an unfavorable situation. So I, uh, you know, I would like to have the ability and the mandate to go and stop oppression anywhere in the world and make the situation better. But I don't deceive myself that I'm either wise or powerful enough to be able to do that. To go into Central Africa, for instance, where some terrible thing is going on and say, OK, you all stop. The Canadians are here now. You know, go to your rooms, smarten up. Uh, didn't work in Somalia, it, did it? it yeah, it, it's not that it's not, it shouldn't be done. It's that it can't be done. And there's a, you know, there's an axiom. You cannot have a moral duty to do something impossible. But where you can do it, where you can protect your own interests and those of the people on behalf whose behalf you intervene, you have to do it. I mean, again, you look at the fighting over Belgium in World War One. Why did we fight over Belgium? Who knows any Belgians? And yet it was, you look at how Belgium has turned out thanks to the allies fighting for them in two world wars. Uh, it's been good for us and we should have done it sooner. It's also obviously been very good for them. I mean, this argument, we're talking about, you know, trying to convince people that Marxism doesn't work. You look at what happens to the countries the Marxists get, and you look at what happens to the countries we stop the Marxists from getting. Even the ones that aren't that great. You know, the South Korea or Taiwan had a hit, struggled with repression, but they did, they really wanted to stop it, and eventually they managed to. Whereas clearly the communist Chinese or the North Koreans or Fidel Castro didn't want to stop oppressing their people. They thought you could drag your subjects to paradise in chains. Right. And, and uh, even you know, Khrushchev started to hear about that. 
Yeah, especially if you uh, happen to be the vanguard and you're calling the shots, right? So, anyway, uh, getting back to, to the Korean conflict. So, we get over there. Uh, we have, a, relatively speaking, a small contingent. There's a bunch of others. The Turks, uh, the Australians are there, the Kiwis. The bulk of the forces, of course, were the Americans. But, once again, as we did in World War One and World War Two, it seems Canadians punched above their weight there. Uh, in, are you familiar with the Battle of Cap Young? That's uh, considered to be our um, greatest uh, battle that, that Canadian forces participated in during that conflict. Yeah, I, mean, I know about it. I wouldn't call myself an expert on it, but it certainly it reflects the Victor Davis Hanson thing that a very badly outnumbered group, you know, short on ammunition and everything, had the tenacity and the fl- flexibility to work out a defensive system that resisted what looked like an overwhelming attack. And again, you think about how many Chinese soldiers died and for what, you know, both tactically and strategically, all those lives were absolutely wasted. Whereas those Canadians who died in Korea died for something meaningful. You know, I was talking, as I mentioned, to veterans that I had met there and fellow was telling me, because uh, a lot of the Chinese would surrender, like they had rags wrapped around their feet, and so they basically had lost most of their feet to uh, frostbite, and so, you know, some of them would commit suicide because they'd heard from their higher-ups that, you know, we were bloodthirsty monsters, and so the, the Chinese were astonished that they were given food and, and how uh, humane we were to to them versus what they'd heard were going to happen if they ever got captured. So I think again in in the, in reverse when you look at the conditions that people had to suffer under uh, as prisoners of war of the Chinese and the North Koreans versus how we treated prisoner of wars on our side. I mean it, it kind of underlines the point you're making about the humanity of the free person. Yeah, we are the good guys. And it also underlines a point, Victor Davis Hanson, again, Carnage and Culture is actually an encouraging book, which is rare for a book that's actually accurate about public affairs. But he says, one of the differences between free and unfree societies is that we understand our enemies. They don't understand us. The Americans, for instance, in World War II in the Pacific, understood that the Japanese would torture and execute them and that surrender was a very bad idea. And that was true. The Japanese thought the Americans would do it to them, and they were wrong. And when they surrendered, the same experience of being given medical care and humane treatment and and just being baffled. How can this cannot be happening to us? Uh, Because they had such a distorted image of their enemy. And again, one wonders, you know, there's always been this suspicion, like if the Soviets and their allies had ever invaded Western Europe, would the soldiers have been so stunned by the prosperity that they would have stopped fighting? If the North Korean army ever got into South Korea... Would the troops stand and stare about the Buck Rogers thing uh, and say, this was all a lie? I, I, I wouldn't want to count on it. But they would certainly be astonished if they saw how the average person was living. He's a historian, and this is the Germans too, who again are a Western nation that took a couple of very wrong turns in the 20th century, that during the Battle of the Bulge, they captured some American positions and they found that there was cake. And they said, we've lost the war. We're fighting people who report to take into a battle, so they are so logistically superior to us. We're yeah, I, I used to uh, teach in a few universities over there. I was teaching a public administration course, uh, you know, in English. And uh, one of the fellows who was taking the course worked for the unification ministry. So he's a Korean guy. We used to go out drinking together. And he invited along some North Korean defectors because part of his department would place people and sort of help them integrate in society. And uh, I can't speak Korean that well, so it was through a translator. But I would I would ask them, like, what surprised you the most? And, and they said, everything. Everything. Like, I didn't know that that people had gone to the moon in Korea. Like, I didn't know what Mickey Mouse was. Wow. Like, they never heard of anything. Like, they didn't have any idea. Uh, you know, the, just the buildings and so on. Of course, they went through China and then had sort of, I guess... A, you know, a staged integration into it, you know, but getting to the South and the contrast of what they'd heard about what the conditions were like in the South, where basically the South Koreans are bootlicking slaves to these slavering fanged Americans who strut around, you know, they just couldn't believe, uh, you know, how well the South Koreans had done and how kept in the dark they were. Like, again, like imagine uh, 
in the 1990s, not knowing that we would visited the moon, although, of course, there are some people who think we haven't, but I think most people think we have. So oh, sure, and, the West are free to have kooky conspiracy theories, but that, yeah, because it, it would be to admit that the Americans were technologically advanced. And, of course, you always get the schizophrenic quality in totalitarian propaganda. On the one hand, our enemies are incompetent and subhuman. On the other hand, they're fiendishly plotting with enormous resources against us. Uh, and, and so you get a picture that is very, very brittle uh, because it's so full of, of internal contradictions. And I remember there's actually a story that was told by Nathan Sharansky about when he was in the Soviet Union. And he would practice his English. He was allowed to read these English language communist newspapers that were published in London, but were available in Moscow. And of course, they were filled with scathing denunciations of capitalist society. But he said, the more I read them, the more I realized that the West must be free because people could publish these newspapers without fear of reprisal. Uh, and so th this this ludicrous picture that they paint is very vulnerable. And that's partly why the government in North Korea is so hysterical about its control. It can't afford to relax because the whole thing will come down. Well, this is the whole thing. Given that now uh, they've had this summit, isn't this opening the can of worms from the North Korean perspective? I mean, you can't put it back in the box anymore, can you? If you <laughs> see the, if, if Kim Jong-un, I, I mean, I've been uh, seeing reports uh, through the North Korean media, how they're covering it. You know, and smiling in front of an American flag. I mean, this is, totally counters the narrative that these people have been hearing since 1953. It's like, how do you put that back in the box? Do you know what they, I mean? Like, there's find, no going back now, is there? They may find they can't, like Gorbachev, right? The man who destroyed communism. That's it. By That's exactly the analogy that I was thinking of. And, and certainly by the, by the you know, Brezhnev was no Kim Jong-un. He was not a nice man by any stretch of the imagination, but he was better than that. But yeah, the, the, uh, and the, the North Koreans are, I've often thought when people analyze the situation, oh, the Americans can't do this, they can't do that, these wise Western pundits who basically say the hyperpower is paralyzed. And I look at this sometimes and think, well, would you trade our problems for theirs? You know, let, let us not overestimate our adversaries' uh, resources. The North Koreans are, they, they, there are some things they can do, including tell insane lies, but, but they're actually not in a very attractive position in all sorts of ways. And they're on very. One of them is they're on very thin ice. The moment you start letting letting it go, even though you think you control all the news, um, you, your lies are brittle. The truth is strong and resilient. Uh, and that again is why it was worth fighting for in Korea. That it really is suited to the dignity of human beings in a way that even benign falsehood is not. And in the end, I think you'd have to say that communist falsehood was not benign. Yeah. Here. Here. You know, I'll make a prediction that if things do open up in North Korea, you're going to see the Koreans, who I consider the toughest people on earth. Like, the will of those people is it just astounds me as a Canadian, just seeing how kind of lily-livered we are, to get it done. I, I was there during the 1997 economic collapse, and the Koreans pulled themselves out of it just like that. I mean, they astonished the world. Uh... I feel like once the cracks form, like there's just going to be a flood and we'll see prosperity there within a decade. Uh, you know, if anybody on earth can do it, it's got to be the Koreans, I reckon. And, you know, that would be a wonderful end to the Korean War is to have finally the North enjoy the blessings of liberty, material and otherwise. So let's hope that happens. Absolutely. John, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. And I'd love to talk to you particularly about an issue that uh, a lot of people talk about in an American context, which is guns. You've written this book on the gun culture here in Canada, which uh, I haven't read it all yet. I'm in the midst of reading it. But when I'm done, I'd love to uh, have a chance to sit down and talk to you about just the gun culture in general, because I think a lot of Canadians, they are very aware of what the Americans think about guns, but they're not even aware. Like I always find it's a problem with Canadians that we're not aware of our own history because we're so swamped with american history because superficially at least it seems cooler and we hear about it a lot more that we somehow think that their experience is our experience and uh i think you make the point in your in your book that we do have a commonality of experience but uh things have played out a little bit differently yeah, so but I, I, both of our histories go back to magna carta and beyond and our history is very cool too and if people want to get the book let's tell them you go to my website that's johnrobson.ca and go to the store awesome uh, i've really enjoyed it john thanks very much for your time and god bless well thanks very much hope to talk to you again soon